How many people in the United States do you think have owned cars a century ago? A century ago, almost in 1900, zero people, zero percentage owned cars. And today, over 80% of people own cars. That's a tremendous growth. It shows the prosperity, the economic growth of the people, and the sustainability of their life, which is a very, very positive thing. The first car was developed in 1678. So from a vehicle which was invented in 1678, which there's no evidence that it can ride, today we have vehicles that are almost semi-autonomous. And you have seen the number of people owning cars. That's a great, great, great growth, right? However, I want to point out, with all the positive things that come around, there's a lot of challenges. What happens to all these cars post their service life? Let me ask you another question. What percentage of your car you think gets back into the system? The right answer is almost 80%. There's no regulation. That's the main thing. In Europe, there's a mandate that 95% of your vehicle has to be recycled. Only 5% can actually go to the landfill. What do we call this going to the landfill? Leakage to the environment. In US, that number is 80. So 20% 20 of it is leaked to the environment. If you think that's a pretty small number, why should we worry about? Let me tell you, this is just from the automotive sector. How much waste outside the automotive sector goes into the landfill? So the key idea is we need to minimize the leakage and get back the material back into the system. That's the idea, right? Okay, this is all about post the service life. Let's look at what happens to the vehicle during the service life. There's so many cars, as you have just seen, over 80% of the people own cars. With so many cars going in on the road, there's a lot of pollution. If you have seen the statistics, over the past couple of decades, the pollution which has resulted into global warming has resulted in almost one degree centigrade increase in the temperature. All the issues that you are seeing with the climate are because of this. And a recent study also showed that you don't do anything. You just don't contribute any more excess uh, carbon dioxide into the environment. If you keep everything as is, over the next couple of decades, the temperature is going to raise additional 1 to 1.5 degrees centigrade. That's going to be very dangerous, my friend. So we need to be careful about polluting the environment. Is automobile industry doing anything for this? Of course, absolutely. There's been a lot of scientific innovation that's happening. If you look at the CAFE standards, since 1970 till today, you can see how much fuel economy the vehicles have achieved. That resulted in lower emissions. Whether it's light weighting, or is it because of uh, highly efficient engines? A lot has actually played into this. But can you believe only 25% of a vehicle's energy goes into actually driving the vehicle. 75% of that actually goes as a waste. So the impact that we are seeing right now, it's not big. So what has actually industry done for this? It's actually looking into electric cars. And this particular electric car was not even powered through electricity. In a sense, electricity charging the batteries. It's basically the steam that was driving this vehicle. So it's an environmentally friendly vehicle, but was, that was charged or powered by steam. So looking at the in-service life of the vehicle, electric cars are a great invention because during the service life, they have zero emission compared to the IC engines, cars, right? That's basically the key thing which has been propelling this entire electric car industry, which is absolutely correct. During the entire service life, they have zero emission. But the challenge comes is when you look at the batteries, you need to power them. How do you power them? You charge using electricity. And electricity, how is it generated? There are three main sources, hydro, nuclear, and coal. Can you guess what proportion of US electricity is actually generated through fossil fuels? 
it's 60 percent, over 60 percent. So that means a location, wherever the electric power generation facility is, there's a lot of pollution and emissions over there. So if you're just thinking about using fossil fuels to propel your vehicle from one place to the other, think about the electricity that's using a lot of fossil fuels to generate it, which is what you're using to charge your battery. So forget about looking into silos that an electric car is environmentally friendly just because it doesn't give you an emission. If you actually put together the whole context, the life cycle of the electric car, when you take in the raw material extraction all the way, everything together, all that you're saving is just five tonnage of carbon dioxide. And do you know how much one tonnage of carbon dioxide costs? Roughly around $40. So what are you saving across the entire life cycle of an electric car? About $200. And what are the incentives you are getting? Much, much more than this. So you have to actually look into a full system level. It's all about looking at the entire system and then making choices. That's exactly what we focus in my research at Clemson University. We basically enable and embrace the circular economy concept, and we have developed what we call circular engineering. The key difference between these two, circular economy is a great domain. We are trying to find out the materials that actually can be repurposed and put it back into the system so that there's minimal leakage to the environment. That's kind of what the philosophy is. In a circular engineering, we're doing exactly the same, but we are going beyond the materials. We're even considering the manufacturing practices. We're even considering the supply chain domain of it. How we can actually make everything so very sustainable. The seven R principles which I call that we follow in our lab are reduce, redesign, reuse, recyclable, remanufacture, recover, and renewable. And we just don't look at purely materials aspect of it, but we go all the way from design, virtual validation, prototyping, experimental validation, looking at the entire life cycle of a product development. So when you look at the circular engineering aspect of it and couple that with the product development, a circular product development approach where you embrace all of these different domains, that's exactly what we focus upon. Let me explain you this with an example of an impactful project that we are doing within the automotive industry. This project, which focuses on creating an ultra lightweight composites door, as you can see, it pretty much includes six R's out of the seven. The only reason seventh R was not included is because we wanted to make it practical, applicable, and readily commercializable. That's the only key difference there. The key aspects of this project, which the solicitation asked for is achieve a light weighting of around 42 and half percentage, which means that you take an existing steel door and you make a new composites door, and when you take both of them and put together next to each other, the composites door has to weigh 42 and a half less than the steel door. Everything remaining the same. What everything means? The functionality, the safety requirements, and all of them should remain the same. That's a great thing. And then, one, another thing is, just because you're using advanced technology in terms of materials and manufacturing, you're not supposed to go as much as you want in terms of the cost enhancements. They have done a severe cost check on us. For every pound of weight that you save, you cannot go over $5. That actually puts a big, big task on us. At one point, we were even thinking that we'll probably come to ounces when it comes to light weighting, and we'll probably come to pennies when it comes to the cost calculations. And it's not that you produce this particular technology that you're making, only that is good for lab scale, which is basically sitting inside the four walls of Clemson University. That's not the goal. You have to make sure the technology that you produce is commercializable for 20,000 vehicles at least. That's almost double the production of the BMW i3 that you see today, which is the most carbon intensive vehicle out there, carbon fiber composite intensive vehicle out there. The last one, which I purposefully put as self-imposed. There itself, you can see the philosophy that I completely embrace in. The funding agency never even asked for 
recyclability or repurposability or sustainability at all. We purposefully put that we will make sure this door is 100% recyclable because we feel incorporating circular engineering in such an impactful project is our responsibility. At one point, sustainability was a choice. Today, sustainability is a must. And that's exactly what we would like to embrace in this. One question that always came up with people, it's a lightweight composite store. Can it meet the safety requirements? Because I don't want to die. It's a driver's side front door. When you drive in a vehicle which is lightweight, when something comes and hits you, yes, it meets all the other things, but you don't want to die. This is our response for that. We created and we simulated and we showed that our design, our material choices, our engineering aspects, as well as the entire design platform that we have developed for the door, including the manufacturing practices that we are now implementing, everything meets the standards that, we have, that have been set by the federal regulations. The two animations that you see here, one represents the side impact pole. Just assume that your vehicle is actually going and hitting a pole that's out there. Things may happen, right? But you can see that the composite store is as safe as a steel door. And the other one, you can see the same particular crash, but with the vehicle, with the, with the person inside. And you can see that there's absolutely no problem from the intrusion standpoint, from the energy absorption standpoint. So the ultra lightweight door that we have developed, of course, we couldn't meet the 42 and a half percentage weight reduction. Practically speaking, we were able to meet only 38 percentage. However, at a 38 percent reduction, we were able to demonstrate that you can make a composites lightweight door that can meet all the performance metrics. By providing 38 percent lightweight technology for a door, and if you have multiplied that for four doors and expand that for the whole vehicle, think about how much lightweighting you are actually doing and by doing this lightweighting, how many emissions of, or how much carbon dioxide tonnage you are actually reducing during the service life of the vehicle. And this door and the technology is completely re recyclable. So post to the service life, think about the materials coming back into the system, no leakage to the environment. That's the idea we would like to embrace on. Coming to the materials domain, as I said, Zero leakage to the environment. That's the philosophy that we follow. That's the vision that we have. With such a vision, I want to say that we started now making new material systems which are recyclable by design. So how are we doing this? We are purposefully creating molecular zippers. So you probably know about molecules. You know about zip, right? You basically, every pant has a zip. So what do you do? You unzip, you zip. You unzip, you zip. Exactly the same philosophy if you put that in a plastic. When you zip it, you use it. When you unzip it, you basically recycle it. That is why we are calling this as molecular zippers. And so we are creating these molecular zippers and putting them in conventional plastics so that once the plastics are out of their service life, you can recycle them 100%. So our research doesn't stop simply about at creating molecular zippers. In addition to that, what we also try to do is embrace the renewability. Remember the seven R's. Recycling is just one. Reusing is just one. Remanufacturing is just one. But when you combine all of this, and we would also like to add on renewability on the top of it. So the polymers, the precursors, the zippers, everything that we create are actually from natural resources. And what are these resources? These are the biomass, which is again available abundantly. One philosophy, additional philosophy that we also follow is we absolutely don't use any food derived systems because our definition of sustainability is not to snatch away the food resource of the current generation to provide a sustainable resource for a future generation. That's not sustainability. The true sustainability is someone which makes sure adequate resources are available right now and don't snatch away the food resource, but provide a sustainable alternative. That is why we use biomass, and we actually create all these molecular zippers from it. 
Finally, I want to leave you guys with a message. The vision that I started with, which is a circular engineering, and the kind of examples that I've shown from the lab, of course, we would like to embrace that particular vision. Because once Mahatma Gandhi said, hesitating to act because the whole vision might not be achieved or because others do not share it yet is an attitude that only hinders progress. That's the reason we just wanted to act upon whatever little things that we can do to embrace the bigger vision of circular engineering within the automobile industry. Hopefully, that can create an environmentally conscious vehicle in future. Thank you. <laughs>